Warhammer 40k is one of the darkest franchises ever made. Even if you're only vaguely familiar with the property, you know it's full of some pretty dark stuff. I mean, really dark. It's literally the franchise that coined the term grimdark, which would subsequently give rise to an entire literary genre of grimdark fiction. Now, most of the horrifying things you'll encounter in the pages of its stories are done by the menagerie of savage, grotesque, and even hedonistic alien species, or by the demonic forces that live just beyond the veil of our universe and are aided by their insane, chaotic cults that worship them. But in a lot of instances, the Imperium of Man itself can actually be just as brutal, if not far more grimdark. Justifyingly, frankly terrifying actions under the guise of being the lesser evil. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at five of the darkest things within the Imperium. From the absolutely terrifying way the lobotomized servants of the Emperor known as Servitors are actually made, a merchant guild that has been tasked with possibly the most disturbing job imaginable, and an example of an Imperial hero, a woman said to be so great that her followers demand she be recognized as a saint. But in reality, she had some insanely dark methods for achieving her bloody goals. We're going to be talking about all that and a whole lot more. So let me know if you like content like this by dropping a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. Oh yeah, and let me know down in the comments if you know of any other super dark things from 40k you'd love to hear me cover. It's a pretty big universe and I always get the best ideas for videos from you guys. Anyways, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're going to dive headfirst into the grimdark. I want to tell you about these amazing t-shirts that you see me wear in all my videos. Now they're made by this super cool clothing company called Into the AM, and they're the sponsor of this week's video. I wear these shirts just about every single day, as not only are they some of the most comfortable t-shirts I've ever owned, but their designs are frankly out of this world. It's been almost a year now since I first started wearing their stuff, and so far, even though they've gone through the wash like 50 or 60 times, I've experienced no shrinkage, color fading, or anything like that, which is frankly ridiculous. I can't tell you how many times I've had a graphic tee that I really liked, but I ended up having to throw it away because it got all faded and just didn't look as good as when I first bought it. It's not the case with the shirts by Into the AM. They hold their image quality incredibly well. Now their graphic tees are definitely my favorite, but they also make some pretty amazing hoodies and all over tees as well. They also make a line of basic tees that, although a little less flashy than the graphic ones, maintain that premium Into the AM comfort. Their shirts look amazing, are super comfortable, resistant to shrinkage and fading, and are shockingly really affordable. As my listeners can click on the link in the description of this video or go to intotheam.com slash Weshammer to get a bundle of three t-shirts for only $60. But it gets even crazier than that because by using my link, you can get an additional 10% off your entire order. Again, that's intotheam.com slash Weshammer. So click on the link in the description and pick out something awesome for yourself today. You can thank me later. Big thanks to Into the AM for sponsoring this video. If you're not familiar with Servitors, they're easily one of the darkest things in all of Warhammer. Now, I'm gonna give a brief rundown in this segment of what they are for people who are new to the franchise. But the real takeaway here is not what they are, it's how they're made. And I gotta tell you, it's pretty disturbing. A Servitor is a fusion of human flesh and sanctified metal. Now, often these mindless creatures are created from harvested corpses or vat-grown bodies, but more commonly are made from mind-wiped human criminals that have angered or offended the Adeptus Mechanicus in some way. These people will end up being lobotomized, having their minds wiped and reprogrammed, and then cybernetically enhanced. From the Mechanicum's perspective, these people have been improved, and even criminals and heretics are given another chance to serve the Omnissiah. These cyborg creations can be found throughout the entirety of the Imperium, and are used to perform any number of different monotonous or dangerous functions. They are completely obedient, and have no regard for their own safety, willing to follow orders to the letter no matter what they may be. Most are not capable of speech, unless this is part of their reprogramming done after the lobotomy. And it's only done when it's deemed absolutely necessary for whatever their specific role will end up being. To run an empire as large as the Imperium, artificial intelligence is basically a necessity. But due to the fear and hatred of thinking machines prevalent throughout human society, the Servitors are the closest the Imperium is willing to get to a functioning AI without committing tech heresy. It's a convenient workaround, considering that a human brain is still being used in combination with all of the different systems that make a servitor work, rather than being just a machine that can actually think for itself. Servitors come in an endless variety of different types, from disturbing works of art that are created to serve the desires of the rich and powerful, to bulky, misshapen labor units created to work in the most dangerous of industrial zones, to even mindless combat drones equipped with all manner of heavy weaponry. 
Most of the servitors you'll see are made just to perform mundane tasks, such as routine maintenance, loading freight, sorting through endless dockets, or acting as a guard for a particular area. Now, this is where they get kind of dark, but I have to preface this with it's insanely rare. But there have been a few notable examples of servitors who have maintained some form of diminished sentience, whether that be them suddenly regaining consciousness and awakening to the horror that is their existence, or in other cases, being fully conscious after the process that was made to create them. It's as if they're suffering from a form of locked-in syndrome, where their mind stays completely intact, but they're unable to control their body, forced to live on for centuries, doing meaningless task after meaningless task. But perhaps the most disturbing thing about servitors is the process in which they are made. Now, most of the details about this process are shrouded in secrecy, as the Adeptus Mechanicus rarely ever lets outsiders bear witness to the condemned's apotheosis into a form more pleasing to the machine god. But there is one example from the novel Flesh and Steel, a Warhammer crime novel that follows our main character, probator Simeon Dimaximin Noctis. He's working on a murder case that involves a rogue servitor, and he ends up getting a backstage tour of the Mechanicus facility where the servitors are made. And I'm gonna warn you right now, it's pretty disturbing. The cold smell hit me like a brick, like a meat store, where astringents couldn't hide the smell of incipient rot. There were notes of feces to go with the blood and decay, but the sound was the worst. Shouting, screaming, praying, weeping, all the cries of human terror and misery. I'm not a squeamish man, and nor do I spare tears for those who deserve punishment, but what I saw in the processorium haunts me still. Naked human beings were standing in a switchbacked line between high fences. Outside the fences, Adeptus Mechanicus menials in environment suits stood guard with shock goads in hand. The people, all mature men and women, were shepherded down the caged walk like livestock, like they were food beasts being led to the slaughter, meat for the ravenous appetite of the machine god. I grew up lucky enough to eat real meat. I was unlucky enough to see where it came from. Another gift of my father on another damn tour of my family's various businesses. The Manufactorum produced servitors, but it was more akin to an abattoir than a workshop. Every surface was easily cleanable. Large plastic flaps divided areas from each other. Servitors with spray units surgically attached their backs, prowled about, hosing filth into slit drains set into the perfectly smooth slanted floors. We walked above all this, past sentry pods on spikes occupied by galvanic rifle arm snipers. Our path went from one end of the hall to the other, and I could see pretty much the whole sorting process, beginning to end. As the line slowly advanced, the people were passed through various scanning devices, and most of them mounted in ugly, functional arches that let out a constant series of acceptance chimes. Occasionally, one would let out an angry blare, and the indicator lumens would flash red. The rejected person was then swallowed up by a trap door, opening beneath their feet. From these pits wafted a hideous stench and the grinding sounds of industrial mensers. One rejected man grabbed onto the lip and hung their arms and hands bloodied, shouting a stream of defiant profanities. Guards lined the grating either side of him and shocked him until he fell. The adepts wouldn't even waste bullets on these people. The trapdoor flipped up and the next terrified person was ushered forward. A number of pneumatic gates separated the people from each part of the process, snapping open and shut with bone-crushing force. Violent metal arms snatched them up and spread-eagled them in the air, and a servitor shearer shaved them all over. At another, they were subjected to a high-pressure counterseptic wash, whose chemical stink made me choke from a hundred feet away. More scanners, more rejects winnowed out. Machines forcibly dressed them in the heavy rubberized garments common to all monotask servitors. They were saggy on them, all one size, until another process force shrank them to fit their bodies, where metal cuffs, sockets, and collars bit into vulnerable flesh. The last few prayers gave way to screams at that point, and even the most stoic shouted in pain. They were ushered over a floor, buzzing with power that made them shriek with every footstep. What is that for? I asked. Jelling answered only reluctantly. Follicular inhibitor, to stop the hair growing, he said. How? I asked. But Jelling was done answering. Come, come this way. He waved me over to a door, but I didn't come this way. I watched numbly. The shivering lines of terrified men and women reached a final series of gates where a high energy auger beam of such potency it made my data slate buzz passed over them. Dazed, they were manhandled into different queues and then hustled from the room to their fates. Jelling gripped my elbow with surprising strength and pushed me out of the hall. This way, please, he said. Thankfully, I was spared a few of the surgeries. I doubted the Adeptus Mechanicus provided anesthetic. 
for the same reason they would not dull the pain of a nail under a hammer. One of the most commonly cited grimdark things about the Imperium is their persecution of psychers. The fact that thousands of people are sacrificed every single day to the Astronomicon. But what's particularly disturbing to me is the black ships that are sent to round these people up. Psychers are one of the most feared, misunderstood, and hated groups of people in the 42nd millennia. They are individuals that are capable of bringing about great ruination with simply a thought. And considering the horrifying conditions most of humanity is forced to live in within the Imperium, having an uncontrolled person with the power of a nuclear warhead at their disposal going undocumented and uncontrolled is a horrifying concept. Now, obviously not all psychers are this powerful. Some simply have the ability to read minds or change a person's emotional state. Well, others are strong enough to bring about the complete collapse of a planet single-handedly. Without relentless training, the more powerful abilities that some of these psychers can generate become harder and harder to control. But the greatest threat posed by unsanctioned psychers is their susceptibility to chaotic corruption and demonic possession. In a worst case scenario, a psyker could unwillingly become a warp portal in which a demonic incursion can flow through and quickly overrun a planet. The Imperium deals with this threat by utilizing the fleet of black ships ancient, dreaded vessels that scour the galaxy, traveling from planet to planet and taking a tithe of each of a world's psychers. These individuals are rounded up and contained within the ship's numerous cells. Now, despite their terrifying appearance, these ships are less like a war vessel and more like a giant floating maximum security prison designed specifically for psychers. Each and every one of them has a huge crew, with a large portion of them being blanks, and normally women from the Sisters of Silence. A blank is a person who can project a negative aura that shuts off a psyker's connection to the warp. Under normal circumstances, having tens of thousands of psychers gathered in a single place is an insanely dangerous situation. But when it's counteracted by the thousands of blanks, the threat is severely diminished. The ultimate destination of the ships is Terra itself, where the Psychers will be handed over to the Scholastica Psychana. The lucky ones will be conscripted into service and trained to become what is known as a sanctioned Psyker, individuals who will use their gifts in the name of the Emperor for the rest of their lives. But the others who are deemed uncontrollable will end up serving the Emperor in a different way. They will be literally sacrificed to the Golden Throne, having their life essence and power drained from them like batteries until they wither to dust, their essence joining with the Emperor in order to help him power the Astronomicon and keep the forces of chaos at bay. The lore originally stated that it was around a thousand psychers that were rounded up and sacrificed each and every day. But as the story has progressed into the 42nd millennium, the Golden Throne has begun to fail, and the estimated number of psychers sacrificed in this way is rumored to be far higher. It's said that the inside of these ships is like a nightmare prison for the condemned. Everything about the ship, from its black walls, its strobing lights, its psycho-conditioned guards, the blanks that patrol the halls, the drugged slop they call food, and the constant feed of tranquilizers the jailers pump into their living cargo. All of it is designed to break you, to crush your spirit into submission and accept your fate. You aren't a human being. You are anathema psychana. You are a mistake to be corrected. By simply being born as a psyker, you have committed the sin of existence, and your innocence proves nothing. Now, the concept of living in a hive city is already pretty dark. There are impossibly massive cities that can house billions of people. And it gets even crazier when you look at a hive world, which is an entire planet covered in hive cities. These worlds can have populations in the quadrillions. Now, there are a lot of different systems in place to keep such a place running smoothly, one of which is the merchant guilds. They're what hold all of the great houses of Necromunda together, and regulate trade throughout all of its cities. There is the Prometheum Guild, sometimes known as the Torchbearers, that control the light and power of Hive Primus. The Water Guild, that manages the distribution of one of the most valuable resources to ever exist, water. And even the Slave Guilds, who manage the trade of captured and enslaved gangers, basically taking criminals and turning them into prisoners for profit. But by far the most disturbing of all is the Mercator Pallidus, the Corpse Guilds. The Corpse Guilds are said to be one of the most important and powerful guilds within the hive world of Necromunda. They regulate the trade and production of the foodstuff known as corpse starch, a starch-like paste literally made from ground-up bodies. Living in a hive city is a pretty bleak and miserable existence that gets even worse the further down into the hive you go. Billions of people can live in a hive city, and due to their ridiculous populations, millions of people are born and die each and every day on a hive world. If there hadn't been a system in place to deal with the extraordinary amount of corpses a hive city produces, then plague and disease would end up running rampant. 
So the Corpse Guilds serve two fundamental purposes. It first is the disposal of the dead, to prevent the outbreak of plague, and second, rendering those bodies down into a viable food product in which to feed the hive's enormous population. Each and every cycle, the Corpse Guilds send their members to collect thousands of dead bodies with which they fill their mortuary caverns, keeping them secured until they are ready to be processed. Death is an incredibly lucrative business within Necromunda, and thus few other guilds have the resources or members in which to challenge the Corpse Guilds. Necromunda is also rife with superstition, and it's said to even look upon a Corpse Guilder is bad luck. When word gets out that one of these Spectres of Death are going to be heading towards a settlement, they will often arrive to find all of the windows and doors boarded up tightly, and all of the dead bodies laid out neatly in the streets for them, the living population not even willing to so much as look upon the harvesters. Perhaps even more disturbing is what is known as a corpse grinder cult, of which many have formed out of the places in which the bodies are processed. Even in an environment as horrifying as a hive city, the individual workers that are burdened with the task of rendering their fellow hivers into corpse starch are at an incredibly high risk of having a psychotic breakdown. The whirring of massive meat saws and the crunch of bone grinders causes their minds to rebel against reality. These individuals who were once selected for the job because of their grim detachment from emotion and ability to carry out their dark duty with efficiency and composure become little more than deranged lunatics, obsessed with flesh and blood. They become cannibals that set out into the dark, an ancient evil from beyond the veil whispering in their mind to enact ever more grisly murders in which to feed their twisted desires. Many of these cults worship what they call the Lord of Skin and Sinew, which is most likely a stand-in for the blood god Korn. The cults are led by blood-soaked demigods known as Harvest Lords that spread their dark message of slaughter. Now, once the cult is swelled to a breaking point, an uprising is all but inevitable. Order breaks down, and a horde of rampaging cannibals descends upon the population of a hive. The citizens are given a choice. Either join the Corpse Grinder uprising and partake in their forsaken bounty, or become their next meal. The cults are a plague that the great houses are all too familiar with, and while enforcers are secretly sent out to take them down before they grow too large, the houses themselves will do everything within their power to cover up their existence. Chances are you've never heard of something called a Chrono Berserker. I know I hadn't until just recently. It's an obscure monster-type character from one of the old RPG systems called Inquisitor that actually just recently showed up in the new system called Wrath and Glory. They don't get a lot of attention, but these things are pretty horrifying and are basically forced to live a life of eternal slaughter. If they ever stop, something absolutely horrible will happen. Honestly, it sounds like something you'd hear more from the followers of Korn than from the Imperium. Much like a servitor, a Chrono Gladiator is a brutal union of flesh and metal. Uh, the unlucky individuals that are forced to become such a creation are sentenced to undergo extreme athletic enhancement in order to become an absolute killing machine. Most of the people sentenced to death by Chrono are notable criminals, but there have been documented reports of some of them having been taken as slaves, or were debtors that were unwilling or unable to pay back what they owed, instead settling their debts with their bodies and lives. These guys are immensely physically powerful, and are gifted with a wide array of different augmentations specifically designed for combat. They are frequently fitted with oversized hydraulic claws, buzzsaw arms, iron lungs, and piston-driven legs to name a few, many of which even have a form of subdermal armor under their skin, and are force-fed chemicals designed to increase their resistance to pain. Their personalities can vary from gladiator to gladiator, but it's mostly determined by just how much of their humanity they manage to retain. Due to the nature of living a life of constant death and destruction, it's pretty common for whatever humanity they have to quickly be stripped away. What's particularly dark about these guys is where they get their name. You see, in their creation, a clock is placed in either their central nervous system or inside of their heart. The clock is constantly ticking down, and if it was to ever run out, it would explode the timer only pausing in the heat of battle, and time only being added to the countdown when the sensors within the clock detect a very specific chemical pattern released when the individual feels the sensation of shedding blood, meaning the Chrono Gladiators extend their life by stealing it from others. The augmentation process used to create a Chrono Gladiator is particularly barbaric and takes an enormous toll on the victim's sanity. Many end up having to be decommissioned shortly after their surgeries finish, as they awaken as an uncontrollable and mindless killing machine. While there have been reports of some being able to make peace with their fate and end up rising to heights of power as a bodyguard or an assassin. By all accounts, even the Chrono Gladiators that are able to thrive within this new role are particularly insane. 
One such group of gladiators, known as the Timekeepers of Hive Testimonium, were said to take the blood of their kills and mark their time of death on a nearby wall, leaving the mutilated victim to be found by individuals that would spread the message of their particularly brutal execution, and thus increase the gladiators' infamy. Despite their brutal existence, there have been reports of chrono gladiators managing to protect something of a normal life outside of their bloody business, while others have been entirely consumed by a red rage. They know nothing of reason or compassion, and have given themselves wholly over to the pursuit of slaughter. The life of a gladiator is one based upon borrowed time, a life that will inevitably end in a gory explosion. And unfortunately for their masters, it's not uncommon for the gladiators that are running low on time to turn and attack their allies, desperate to spill just a little bit more blood to extend their lifespans. Although a lot of the horrible things the Imperium does can be justified in-universe as a necessary evil in comparison to the eldritch horrors of the 42nd millennium, every now and then you come across a story that reminds you of just how brutal and inhumane the Imperium's mentality actually is. To combat the monstrous, they must in turn be even more monstrous. And the crazy thing is, some of these human monsters end up being put on a pedestal as a hero. Genevieve Almace was a missionary of the Imperial Creed that had been sent on a mission to bring the light of the Emperor to the Coronis Expanse. By all accounts, she had an incredible reputation for success, despite the fact that the world she claimed in the Sector do not normally fall under the Imperial oversight. Despite this, their populations have maintained an unbreakable faith in the Emperor. Such a track record of success by a missionary in such a dangerous, uncharted section of space is incredibly rare, and lends credence to the efficiency of her methods. Her heroic tales have spread far and wide, and even now there are huge swaths of people that demand she be elevated to sainthood. They see her as a shining example of the Emperor's gifts to all of humanity. Though all of her foes looked and fought differently, they all stood in defiance of the Imperial Creed and by utterly and completely obliterating them, her and her missionary inspired the population of dozens of worlds to recognize and embrace the glory of the Imperium and the God Emperor as their savior. This is the legend that is told, but when you start to dig a little deeper and you start to look at what exactly her methods entailed, you see that this person, that many would argue was a saint, was a manipulative monster. This is made abundantly clear by what she did on the world of Trainer's Rest a world within the Coronis Expanse that had gone untouched by the Imperium, and in their isolation, the human population of the world, which numbered in the millions, lived side by side in peace and prosperity with an unknown reptilian Xeno species. Extensive research that was conducted by the scholars of her missionary were never able to identify any single act of war or hostility between the two species, and by all accounts, they maintained a completely symbiotic culture, each providing materials and knowledge that contributed to the other's survival. Genevieve was repulsed by this. She would end up traveling to the world with only a handful of other missionaries, a force that was insufficient for direct military conquest. She instead sought to convert the human population to the Imperial Creed, the worship of the Emperor as the one true God. The problem was, when she started to interact with these people, she found that they were completely happy with their existence, living alongside their Xenos neighbors in peace and harmony. This troubled and disturbed her greatly, and she realized if there would be any form of success to be found upon this planet, she would need to drive a philosophical wedge between the two populations. This would need to be done in order to mobilize the humans against the Xenos abominations. And more importantly, they would need to be willing participants in the slaughter, never questioning the righteousness of their actions. The Xenos that lived on this planet had a different biological makeup to humans, and thus the majority of their populations lived in more tropical areas, zones that she realized had a greater abundance of mineral wealth these minerals were critical to the production of certain technologies, and thus she fabricated the story that the aliens had been refining and gathering these materials in secret, hoarding them in vast quantities in order to eventually strike out and dominate the human population into a subservient slave race. She told them that once they had all been enslaved, they would be forced to make more weapons for their reptilian overlords, who would then set out into the stars to war against the rest of humanity. In addition to this great lie, she dedicated an enormous amount of time to studying the history and religious practices of both species, finding many similarities between the humans' beliefs and the Imperial Creed. She would end up writing a manuscript that got distributed to all of the humans on the planet. 
These writings indicated that the godlike figures the humans worshipped were actually imperial saints. The deities the humans worshipped were something like a pantheon, and she told them that their leader god was actually an incarnation of the emperor. She also told them that the devil allegories they had in their mythology that were known as the Guardians of the Damned were actually the ancient ancestors of their Xenos allies. She used all of this information to drive the population into a religious fervor, word of her revelation spreading like wildfire across the planet. More and more came to embrace her teachings each and every day. Eventually, her penned work would become the mainstream tenet of the planet. These enlightened humans realized that their oldest allies and friends would have to be eradicated. It started small at first, riots taking place within shared population centers between the two species. But over time, these riots escalated into full-blown warfare. It was at this point that Genevieve stepped in to take direct control of the religious zealotry and the righteous brutality that she had inspired. It took only seven years for every last member of the unnamed Xeno species to be hunted down and purged in the name of the Emperor. All of their cities, buildings, and ancient monuments were demolished. Any documents or artwork that even so much as referenced them was deemed as anathema and was defaced or destroyed. In their place were erected countless new statues and manuscripts devoted to the God Emperor. Even from the Imperium's perspective, the war was not without its cost. The elimination of the Xenos had shattered the planet's infrastructure, and even centuries later, it still failed to even come close to its original levels of stability. Despite the desolation, the population maintains an incredibly strong faith in the Imperial Creed and continues to revere Genevieve as the servant of the Emperor who revealed to them who their true enemies were. And that was five examples of the Imperium being super grimdark. Which one did you find the most disturbing? Do you know of any other super grimdark things within the Warhammer 40k universe that you'd love to hear me talk about? What about scary stuff from other factions? What do you think is the most terrifying alien species in all of 40k? What do you personally think is the scariest or darkest thing in the entire franchise? I'm a huge horror movie fan, so I'll take any excuse I can get to talk about spooky stuff. And if this video does well, I'll definitely do more videos like this because I feel like I could make a five darkest things for pretty much every faction. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do over on Patreon. I'm actually working on completely overhauling that, and I'll have an announcement on that coming soon. Thank you very much for watching the video all the way through, and I'll catch y'all on the next one.